Hi, I'm Carol erger -Fass, Exhibit Curator at the Westport Library. Welcome to Episode 5 of Artists in Residences, the Library's Virtual Artist Series. Today, Migs Burroughs talks with Emily Locks. Emily describes herself as part anthropologist, part scientist, and part set designer. And the first time I really got to look at Emily's work, it was of her beautiful, like elegant and simple photos of mason jars with these gorgeous flowers and plants inside. I didn't understand then that the title of the series was called Invasives, um, Beauty versus Beauty, which although the beauty of the images brought me in, the underlying theme of biodiversity was really what became important. So let's join Migs and Emily, and she'll tell us a bit about her body of work and also what she's been up to since the quarantine. Thanks, Carol. Yeah, and thanks again to the library for this series, which allows me to intrude on our, you know, an artist that I always wanted to spend time with, and you can't just do that. Um, so Emily, um, you're at home now, but you're, do you want to talk about briefly your studio and at firing circuits before we, uh, or yeah. what your situation is? Yeah, sure. I mean, like so many people, I am I am stuck at home, and I and uh, my husband is immunocompromised, so I'm really here a lot. Uh, right now, my studio is my dining room table where I've been making collages, and I can share some of those later. Um, but I am part of Firing Circuits Studios, which is in, it's an old factory building in Norwalk, Connecticut. It used to be a lace factory. Um, I think it was built in 1902. And there's uh, approximately, well, there's probably about 20 artists who are in regularly working when there's not a pandemic. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and I, I got that studio four years ago when um, I downsized to a townhouse. Uh, I thought it would be more, nothing more than really kind of a storage space, but it's actually been this, uh, I don't know, tremendous kind of like opening up, being part of this community, a really great creative space for me. And um, I do miss it. And, I, and I've, you know, made some good friends. And, and I think part of the reason I'm venturing out into areas beyond strict photography, like making collages and doing a bit of painting is because I feel comfortable having, you know, spent four years in this space alongside other painters and printmakers. Yeah, no, it's a great space to just wander. I mean, for a visitor, like I'm not in there, but um, to wander and see the different um, studios and techniques and the way people keep their studios. Yeah. Um, but yeah, your work is so, uh, I don't know, maybe the, is, are they ball jars or mason jars? What's the right word for the jars? Uh, I think that they are pickle jars. <laughs> okay, let's get that. <laughs> there's, a, um, there's this whole story behind that, but here I can show one of the yeah. jar images. Right. This is from this little handmade um, oh, yeah. field notes. And uh, that that work, which is has been, it's gotten a lot of attention, which I, I'm, I'm so honored. I really am. I'm. I'm. Couldn't be more thrilled that at some point it's going to be on the walls of the library, and it's been on the walls of a museum um, a year ago in Boston. Uh, but that all started out up in Maine. Um, I had become really interested in uh, native versus invasive species, and um, I was a newlywed, <laughs> um, and my husband's little family cottage. We, I got stuck up there because of foolishly now I know better, but I went up, we went up in one car, he left to go play golf and I was stuck in this little house for a whole day. <laughs> and, um, and I went out to the field and I picked all these wild flowers, some were native, some were invasive. And I, um, I found these really big jars, the jars that you're talking about up in the attic. And I filled them with water and I put them on the table and made these arrangements and took pictures of them. And it was, it was okay. You know, it was flowers in a jar. And then I had this, I don't know, this idea of putting them in the water and up with, you know, backlit with a window behind them. And, um, and voila, the, the series was born um, out of, basically out of 
boredom <laughs> and <laughs> and being stuck in a in a little cottage and and nowhere to go uh, but you know rummage around in the attic yeah so, they, they're beautiful i mean they take on this elegant museum quality of like you just you know you they're, they're contained and they're it's interesting how you take an object a simple thing we see every day like plants and, and you put them in a special place where you have to look at them and they generate all this extra interest and in, and in the, the beauty of them comes through i've seen your prints there you've made giant prints right of some of them yeah. that are almost yeah. like you could get in the jar yourself and they're so big yeah and well thank you i mean i think putting them in the jars definitely turned them almost in you know there's a hat tip to science and the idea of specimen jars mm. um but there's also because there's a series there's also uh a little bit of a hat tip to one of my heroines a anna atkins who you know did cyanotypes and she did a whole series of different types of um seaweed on cyanotype so there's lots of i don't know history i guess uh of of putting you know plants and in various presenting them in various ways and then photographing them and you did talk about books you, you make is this a new thing for you making these handmade books and and do you want to show uh, yeah sure i have i started uh doing handmade books about a, just a few years ago um and i'll share well i can share this one um which is really simple uh it's a called field notes and it's just taking the beauty versus beauty images and putting them into context of the landscapes where I found the images. So instead of just jar after jar after jar, and I'm hoping you can see this, there's also yeah. just some, some, it's very simple. Um, and this is really the most simple form of a book. It's, it's one signature, which means it's one, set of pages folded in half and then um it's sewn together in this case i used blue thread and now, bookmaking is an art in itself where did you learn that or you self-taught i i took i've now taken two workshops the last two summers up at a place called maine media up in rockport maine um with the same teacher uh who you know teaches he i mean he's made incredible books but anyway this is called the colophon page so in each of these there's 25 of these um in this edition of this little guide but each has a different cyanotype image um and then uh when someone buys one you know i sign it and i put what the edition number is there I don't know if this is Can you read? Do you want to read the colophon? Uh, sure. Okay, so uh, Beauty versus Beauty is the first part of a long term project about botanical biodiversity. I hope this humble journal provides a glimpse of my process and the areas in Connecticut, Maine, and Florida where I gathered native, invasive, and cultivated species presented in jars. Voila. <laughs> um, so that's one thing that I do. And then uh, this is another book, which is called Letting the Days Go By. And this is much more complicated. This took me a week to make. And, um, you know, I, this is this Japanese silk uh, cover. And there's only one of these. <laughs> okay. I'd like to make more. Um, but this one is, is very similar in the sense that it's multiple signatures that I sewed together. I printed all of them, sewed it together, and then the idea behind this book is that uh, I should back up and say I one thing for me, the print is really important. So I have spent a lot of time learning how to print and um, and that's partly why I like making the books because it's it's an object as opposed to something on a screen. I know we're on a screen right now, but that is something that's important to me. So this book is just about those moments at home, you know, that those like fleeting little moments that you sort of want to grab onto. Um, and this is, this is Mike and Marisol's grandson, <laughs> Migs. Yeah, <laughs> Migs, Migs knows some of these people. Yeah. <laughs> but um, 
the idea behind this this book is just home as a sanctuary, as a place. Um, I think I say in the back uh, where security and freedom can reside together in comfort. Well, that's very timely. Yeah, it is kind of, I mean, I thought about that uh, last night and I, I actually ran to my studio this morning and ran upstairs wearing my mask and grabbed this and brought it over here mm -hmm. so I could share it. So um, anyway, I won't go through the whole thing, but this is something that I do and I'd like to do more of and who knows, I may be doing more of it as, mm. you know, depending on the situation. <laughs> Yeah, no, they're beautiful. I get a sense because I look more closely at your work online and I can almost hear a grandfather clock ticking in the background. Everything is so serene. You know, everything is like in a still, it's, you know, you know, those movies where it's just tick, 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 and there's something in the, the camera pans and there's a vase and there's a, someone sleeping. I mean, that's, they look like, you know, those kind of movie it's a quiet movie. Yeah. Scene. Well, maybe, I mean, I don't know. I, I think, you know, Roma is one of the most beautiful movies I've ever seen. Mm. And, and I think maybe that's just an aesthetic that I respond to. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, that does conjure up that. Um, just quickly going back to the previous, you mentioned cyanotype. What, for any, what is a cyanotype? So cyanotype is a very, very simple um, photographic process. It's one of the most basic, uh, it's a con usually a con it's a contact print and um, the image is developed in light UV it can be UV light but I do mine in sunlight and uh, I have a couple here to show you and I also have on my screen and I, again I just grabbed these from my studio but some people okay like um, Anna Atkins who I think I mentioned before uh, just take you know plants or whatever they want and put it directly onto the coated paper which is coated with a combination of chemicals that when it's exposed to sunlight it, it develops and in this case this is one I made in Long Island Sound um, used seaweed put it on top and then the chemicals are very gentle they're not terribly toxic at all they're not toxic really uh, and I rinsed it and that's it. So it's kind of an abstract image. Uh, but you can also use negatives. Um, so here's one. It's actually kind of a test print. I have a very, very giant version of this in my studio. This is a cyanotype portrait of my daughter, uh, but I made a negative first. So then I put the negative down on the, on the coated paper, took it outside, exposed it, washed it, and that's what you get. Um, what's the appeal? I mean, I find them appealing, but I just, from your point of view as a photographer, because there's no color, it's not black and white, it's not color, it's yeah. cyan. It's, it's, it is, it's yeah. It is. It's, very, it's very blue. I think they can be kind of dreamlike. Um, I don't know, this isn't showing up very well because yeah. of the light behind it, but they can have a sort of dreamy quality um, when there's a contact. Here's a big one of a... Mm you know, a, a little girl's dress that was made of organza. So. Uh, Almost looks like an x-ray. Yeah, it is. I mean, it's basically what, you know, blueprints um, were, were same, same process. So uh, I think the appeal for me is its simplicity and it's just fun to do. I don't, I don't have these on my website. It's just something I enjoy doing. And you can get very creative with cyanotype. There's a lot more that you can do beyond just expo you know, coating the paper, exposing it, and washing it. I just want to comment whether you want to talk about it or not, or show it this, this Going to Mars series, which, which is about your father's. Oh, yeah. Uh, um, OK, I in. can do, I would have to probably do a share screen. Okay. So mm -hmm. this, is, um, this is a series that is about living with Alzheimer's and my father has Alzheimer's um, and a couple of winters ago I went down and I, I, I spent three winters in Florida helping my stepmother take care of my dad who is you know it's, it's Alzheimer's. Um, I didn't want to do something documentary because that's really been done so much 
what I was trying to do with this series was really kind of get inside his head and imagine what it's like to navigate the world when your map is disintegrating. Um, you know, you're losing your access to language. So, you know, it's, 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 it was interesting to me. My, my father knew the moon was the moon. Um, you know, that's something that's like really basic in nature. Um, but he wasn't sure what, he isn't sure what silverware to use or, or these days even how to use it. And um, so this series is, is about that. And, it, and then I also accompanied it with an essay where I talk about uh, communicating um, with someone with Alzheimer's, where you're re you are really slowing down. Um, you slow down your language. There's, there are certain things that I don't think one should say to somebody who mm. um, is living with Alzheimer's, such as remember when, you know, don't use the word remember. That's like another kind of very basic thing. And didn't you make out, if I read it the same thing, a, a little cheat sheet in the morning to kind of remind him? Uh, yes. So my dad was, he worked for the U.S., for the United States government from his own, entire life. And um, he was, a, he was an expert on China. And he did, he briefed, uh, you know, he worked for, for the Reagan White House. He was on the National Security Council and then for George mm. W. H. Bush, George Sr. And so his briefing is like something that's very familiar to him. So we would make him a briefing card every morning that would remind him where he was, uh, what we were, you know, what we were doing um, that day. And he loved, he loved that. Unfortunately, couldn't do it this winter, but. Um, but just, I mean, I'm just a rhetorical thing, but tell me the audience, when you look at these pictures, you don't hear a clock ticking in the background. I mean, I'm gentle, like, I don't know why that strikes me that way. It's just, there's this slow meditative, you know, passage of time that I, that your pictures capture to me. Thank you. That's. Um, there is a clock. See, I was right. I do. I do. There's a clock on the mantle. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I think a lot of my images have a certain formality to them, so maybe that's mm -hmm. part of it. But um, but also sequencing is is a really important you know thing for me in photography. You know, sequencing the images in a body of work. It's easy if you have a typology, a bunch of images that are all the same in jars or whatever. That's fairly straightforward. But if you're trying to tell a story and it might even be an abstract kind of story like this one is, then sequencing becomes um, important. And I have people, you know, I have a group of, of uh, photo photographer friends who, who were really helpful in helping me sequence these images. Now this one, I don't think is on the website, but this is where my father's reading the briefing card that you refer to. <laughs> So that's a sample, and most of it is on the website. Yeah, my father had Alzheimer's as well, and uh, I don't know, I just, again, relating to the stillness of it, I, I almost think like, you know, the way he might have perceived the world are just these kind of, Im you know, memories, Im image memories, but they're not in context necessarily of his life, you know, because he used to recall things from being in the fifth grade he had a great memory of when he was in the fifth grade, but he could not remember, like you said, which not, which uh, which piece of silverware to use to, to eat. You know. Yeah, I think that's definitely that's a hallmark of the mm -hmm. disease is that you know the older memories are more accessible than short term or working memory. Um, and hopefully, you know, we'll find a some kind of a, a cure or a treatment that's viable for it. Yeah. And um, well, these are so. This is—is is this an ongoing or you've, that's a book? Is it a book? Or? I've, I'm done with going to Mars. Like that's just. <laughs> okay. I feel like I've done my work, but I did do another body of work called um, Lychee Tree Sanctuary that is is very much related to it, and it's just it's the idea that this one place and these 
it's so it's not it's 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 similar in some ways to the idea of this book but you know home as a sanctuary and in this in this case it was the house that i had rented for the last three years in florida so um this, you like looking through screens and windows and fences yeah. there's there's always it seems to be kind of a membrane between you and not always but there's this kind of membrane of either memory or in some of these yeah, yeah. Um, and a lot, so these have been exhibited and so has Going to Mars. Um, not all of these, but a few of these. And there's definitely some references in my mind to things like death in this particular image. Mm. Um, and, you know, how much more beautiful the world becomes when you are facing the prospect of death or memory loss or family loss, which, I mean, this is, this is a project that did come from a, a sense of grief. Um, but I also am finding as I, as I create this work that work that comes from a really personal place um, is meaningful. Uh, so. <laughs> yeah. Well, there seems to be kind of a theme and the other, some of the other artists with the time that we have, there's more an intense focus on, on, more profound issues like that. Right. Well, um, and then the other thing I've been doing at home are the collages. I don't know oh, yeah. if that's something that I can. Yeah, please. We have like five minutes left, five or six okay. minutes or whatever. So this is for me, this, uh, let me just go. I actually have some of the collages in a folder here. Okay. Maybe it's easier to see them this way, but what I've been doing for the last two months is every day I've been sitting down and making a collage. Right. <laughs> and uh, that's the first one. And I have some parameters. I, I don't, I give myself no more than an hour to do them. And, um, Oh, that opened up in Photoshop. Sorry. No, that's good though. It's a bigger shape. Um, so what, um, and what materials just, I mean, you use is multimeter is paint. You paint over images and magazines. Uh, one of my rules after I did that first one is that I don't, I don't, I don't alter anything once it's been glued down. And a lot of stuff is photocopied. Like I've painted a lot of paper and mm. then, and I've altered some images using solvents and then I've made photocopies of them. And so you'll see the same, you might see the same background or the same colors over and over again. And uh, let me just see if I can get back to the, um, so for instance, this, these two, it's obviously, it's the same image, but it's a different collage. And, I don't think that these are really, this is just a way for me to kind of keep my visual thinking going when I'm not able to, to be um, in my studio making, making work. And how do they, just curious, you're, do they just come to you in a kind of a vision or do you, you pre, or they just, you know, I hear writers say, oh, the character wrote himself or herself. Do these well, things kind of create themselves in a way? Like, put me here, put that flamingo over there, or whatever that is. Yeah. I mean, I, in this case, I just worked off of the colors that were in this. I mean, it's, also, I took these with my phone, so that's why the resolution is really bad. But um, I just worked off of the colors that were in the uh, little Audubon uh, heron, you know, image that, that was inspiring me. Um, so usually I just start with color and then... I go from there and it's quick. You know, I don't, the idea is not to agonize over anything. So, um, in this one, the background is a citru is a, an altered magazine page. And then the flower is a mag, it's a pretty famous and the copyright, it, no one holds the copyright to it, just saying. <laughs> yeah. I feel like I was able to appropriate it, you know, uh, without any guilt. Mm. Um, but it's a pretty famous image of a magnolia. And for me, the idea behind this 
um, image in terms of how it relates to my invasives and botanical work, uh, magnolias are like the oldest, um, one of the most ancient family of flowers. In fact, there's a lot of people who think they predate bees. They were pollinated mm -hmm. by beetles. <laughs> so here we are, you know, in this time of climate change, which I realize has kind of receded into the background with the pandemic news. But for me, this making this collage was just a little bit about the landscape being the land being broken up and you know we're confused about the landscape or at least i am at times um but maybe magnolias will outlast all of us <laughs> well what is your you know just your personal outlook um you know yesterday was earth day i think it was yesterday yeah 50th anniversary of earth day which is yeah. um uh so are you are you optimistic i'm hopeful i'm hopeful that maybe uh you know, with this pandemic, people are becoming maybe a little bit closer to nature or more aware of it. And, um, you know, but I do think that, I don't want to get into a political discussion. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> uh, but I, I, am, I am an environmental activist. I consider myself an environmental activist. And, and, that, and so part of my work, especially the botanical work, is to try to raise awareness uh, because it's all part of a really big complicated equation. It's not just it's not just climate change or global warming. I mean, we're losing um, species at a at a phenomenally frightening rate, and um, so biodiversity is a really big part of the conversation and an important one. So that's that's really what my work is addressing. My botanical work. Well, that's great. Well, we're going to, uh, <laughs> Carol, I'll just, I'll just uh, as soon as, right. I know we're out of time. <laughs> you know, no, I'll just give it back to Carol. I want to thank you so much, Emily. This is just beautiful images and, and a wonderful peek into your working, into your world of creating, creating photography and collages. Thank so, you. Thank you, Carol. Thank you so much. Thank you both. Well, thank you too. Um, you know, Migs, your clock ticking. Um, you know, it's such an apt sort of uh, description of our lives these days. And, you know, everything becomes so um, slowed down. So it's awesome to be able to get to um, see your processes and everything. And, and it's just, it's just been a very rewarding experience doing these um, and getting inside people's heads. Um, and how they're dealing creatively with this whole thing. Yes. So um, to wrap up, for more information about all of the library's online offerings um, and any information about the physical library, go to westportlibrary.org. And we hope to see you there soon. Bye-bye. Thank yeah. you.